so elevation gradients are um, very important for defining uh, biodiversity patterns and species composition, but also excellent for study because you have conveniently a lot of different climatic zones uh, within within um, a short distance, and so uh, that's not only logistically easy, but also removes the uh, dispersal limitation as one of the factors which can change the species composition simply species typically can easily disperse up and down its only environment or other biotic factors which might be stopping them. Uh, this title picture is a drawing uh, by uh, Alexander von Humboldt, which is uh, probably the most important um, uh, naturalist explorer um, from um, the colonial from, from the colonial times um, coming from continental uh, continental Europe, specifically from Germany, 1769 to 1859. He's sort of a father of uh, these concepts of uh, elevational zonation of uh, communities. Now, when we look at the importance of uh, mountain ranges, uh, it's very clear where we compare species diversity living in the lowlands as opposed to mountains with, with the land area. So. This is a uh, land area, which is uh, three times larger for lowlands than for the mountains, while for mammals, birds, and amphibian species, more, more of them actually lives in the mountains than in the lowlands. Um, the dark color are species which are basically mountain endemics. Um, the uh, more than 90% of the range is in the mountains, and you can see that in frogs, for instance, it's, uh, um, uh, it's approximately half of all species. This is just a reminder of the map of the floristic diversity, where we concluded that, again, tall, humid, tropical mountains are the hotspots of diversity. When we look at birds, mammals, and amphibians, which are groups sufficiently well known for such analysis, again, we see that um, the absolute hotspots are Northern Andes and Andes generally. Then there is an elevated area um, around Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro, then the foothills of the Himalayas, and finally um, high altitudes of Borneo and New Guinea. Um, when we um, uh, correlate the species diversity with temperature and precipitation, taking these uh, basic climatic parameters out of the consideration, then these are the residuals of diversity. So these are the areas which are species rich and to the degree which can be explained by temperature and precipitation. And again, we, we have uh, mountain ranges basically. So that's a topographic aspect. When we look at these mountain ranges, then we can look at um, again what is the de what is the deviation of uh, species diversity after we do regression on the, the area of individual mountain ranges in this case, uh, or net, net primary productivity or topographic complexity, which is here defined as standard deviation of um, uh, one square kilometer. Uh, pixels in elevation in that region. And so when we look at this, then um, Andes are much more diverse than would uh, correspond their size. Uh, also, they are more diver diverse, especially northern Andes, than would correspond their primary productivity. And when we look at the topographic diversity, then it's again northern Andes, and this time it's also Atlantic forest. Um, and so there is something about northern Andes which, um, which you know, causes this huge diversity. When we look at the distribution of mountain endemics, so that's the species I mentioned, mostly concentrated in the mountains, then um, we have again the Andes. In this case, it's more the central ones. And then we have the islands. We have especially Madagascar, which is not very conspicuous in any other uh, any other analysis. Uh, so because absolute species diversity is not very high, but the, the endemism it is, and then, uh, and then it's, it's New Guinea. 
Now we mentioned uh, uh, net primary production. That's an example which um, uh, can uh, help us to understand the interplay between uh, temperature, um, rainfall, and and um, net primary productivity. Where here uh, temperature is a replacement for elevation. If you remember, then um, there is a five to six degrees Celsius uh, decline in temperature uh, with every 1,000 elevational meters. So when we have, for instance, here um, the relationship between uh, between um, uh, mean annual precipitation and uh, net primary production. Uh, we have it for four different elevations, which is which are characterized by um, by uh, mean temperature. So these are the lowlands where we can see that um, there is an there is a steady increase in productivity with rainfall up about four thousand millimeters, and after that there is a saturation. Basically, you have as much rain uh, as you need, and additional rain is not doing anything for for net primary production. Um, it goes. Uh, it goes for um, uh, the higher elevation um, as well, and then suddenly there is a flat. Uh, there is a flat relationship at twenty at twenty degrees Celsius, which is um, which is about fifteen hundred meters elevational in the tropics. So what happened here? Well, um, basically, uh, the requirements on um, on the rainfall are diminishing with uh, increasing uh, elevation because the evapotranspiration is also declining with with a lower temperature and so we can we actually got here into this saturation part of the curve um, so uh, we suddenly have enough rainfall across the whole range uh, between two and six thousand millimeters and then uh, when we go even higher then the rainfall can actually be a nuisance uh, because it's connected with low solar activity. And so then photosynthesis is suffering at, at higher rainfall areas. And so, uh, so there can be a, um, a reverse in that relationship. Uh, we can look at the same uh, interaction from different angle, looking at uh, temperature, which means elevation against uh, net primary productivity and looking at different levels of rainfall. That is much more straightforward. There is, uh, there is a, a sort of linear interaction, uh, the higher temperature, the, the more primary productivity, uh, as long as we stay in the area typical for forests. Once we get to the border between a forest and savanna, then again, the, the limits on the, on the tree growth is uh, starting to, to be important. Okay, so... Um, uh, the elevation gradients are really exceptional by uh, packing a huge range of ecosystem uh, to the short, uh, the, across short distance to the small area. Uh, we can look at, when we think of rainforests, we can look at so-called complete rainforest elevation gradients. So that means gradients which start at sea coast and go all the way to alpine zone. Of course, this is the minority of gradients in the tropics because alpine zone is somewhere between three and a half and 4,000 meters. And so not all mountains are as high. This is example from our favorite mountain, Mount Wilhelm, uh, which is uh, sufficiently tall. It's the highest peak in Papua New Guinea. And this is example of a, uh, a data loggers uh, placed at different elevations for one year. And when you average the temperature, you get very neat uh, interaction, very neat linear dec uh, decrease of temperature with altitude. In this case, 5.4 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meter elevation. Uh, in some other mountain ranges in the tropics, uh, you can see here it's always very, very tidy. And we have Hawaii, Venezuela, New Guinea, Peru, Bolivia, Himalayas. It's between 5 and 6 degrees loss um, per 1,000 elevation meters. And the, the change of environment is uh, amazing. You can see here in Mount Wilhelm between the uh, 200 meters elevation and, and the timberline and 3,700. 
Um, these are the stations separated by 500 meters with the forest interior and then look uh, up in the canopy so you can appreciate visually the big difference. Mountains um, have, uh, mountains occupy large climate space because of this donation. So when we look at all the locations there are for uh, the space uh, defined by mean annual temperature and annual precipitation, um, uh, each point is one location on, uh, on the planet. Then when we map the, the existing climate space for different ecosystem in, in uh, South America, we can see that um, Amazon is actually very, very small in terms of uh, variation. Cerrado is even smaller. But then uh, relatively um, um, small in territory, Northern Andes are actually quite huge. And that might be one of the reasons for, for this extraordinary diversity we have, we have seen previously. Now, the mountain forests in the tropics are always a very small, very small in area. These are surveys of locations uh, in the tropics above 1000 meter elevation. And um, on this top map, you can see which areas are rainforest in green and which are grasslands and shrublands, which can be either because of the temperature, that means higher elevation, or also lack of uh, rainfall uh, at this high elevation. This is all above 1000 meters. And this is the elevational distribution of land area in different continents, which is actually surprisingly um, different for each continent. Uh, when you look at the South America, that um, generally that's the, the area with the largest uh, mountain regions. But what is extraordinary is the huge areas of grasslands um, uh, at about timberline and, and above it. Um, uh, that is actually even bigger than in Africa, although in Africa, the grasslands area, because Africa is dry, then, then they are more evenly distributed starting already at uh, um, slightly more than 1000 elevation meters. And then Asia Pacific is a completely forested example. There are of course a tiny, tiny areas of uh, alpine meadows, but you can see that um, 1000 meters is actually uh, the forest area, which is bigger than other two continents, but then it goes fast, uh, it, it goes down very fast. Now, when we talk about the weather or climate in the, in the tropical uh, elevational gradients, there is a, a, a essential uh, difference from the temperate zone. In temperate zone, of course, there is huge seasonality. And so when we look at the climate at the timberline, then um, uh, there, is a, there is a cold winter, no vegetation activity. And then during the vegetation season, there can be actually quite warm area. Uh, while um, these kind of areas which get, which, which get warm in a-seasonal tropics will still have trees. And so with, with the, in the tropics, you have to actually push the timber line all the way to the fairly cold area, which um, will uh, which will then uh, spread the vegetation season uh, very constantly throughout the year. Um, you can see this. This is the climate for the for the Mount Wilhelm as a tropical mountain, and then for for, for examples of subtropical and temperate zone and um, the area of the temperature uh, throughout the months uh, above five degrees Celsius is, is shaded here. Okay, five degrees Celsius, you probably remember that this is where we start counting degree days for, for vegetation. That's where the, the activity of vegetation um, gets going. And so when you look at these different profiles, the area above the curve um, defined by five degrees um, Celsius and above is more or less the same. But for Mount Wilhelm, it's spread very evenly, thinly uh, throughout the year, while the, the temperate zone mountain reached that big area in, in one big frenzy in the, uh, in the summer. And this is what is needed for, for the trees to, to persist. So then, at the equator, the temperature of 
um, the warmest um, month is pretty much equal to, to the mean temperature for the growing season, which means entire year. And then the more you get to the north, the bigger difference there is that the, the mean for growing season is pretty much constant. That's because we are talking not about a certain elevation, but we are talking about timberline, which is basically physiological plant limit, not, not a, a elevation limit. And um, the temperature of the warmest month is, is uh, increasing the, the further north we go actually, because uh, that temperature is, becomes necessary to create the, the sufficient number of degree days for the trees to survive. This also means that when you look at the temperature variation, then in the tropical areas, like uh, here you have Venezuela or Papua New Guinea, then um, the difference between day and night is actually much bigger than difference between seasons. And so you can experience the entire variation of the, of the temperature within 24 hours stay there. While opposite situation is, uh, opposite situation is um, in, uh, in temperate zone. So this leads to one interesting phenomenon, um, which was described by, by Ben Jensen uh, in um, an interestingly named paper, uh, why mountain passes are higher in the tropics. And he does not mean higher elevationally. He means that when you look at the seasonal variation between low and high um, elevation in the tropics, then um, their temperatures never overlap. Yeah, there are the, there is this very steady temperature which is which is low at high elevation and which is high at low elevation, and so that uh, encourages the species living there to have narrow physiological tolerance because they they never encounter any kind of variation, and so that means um, there is no in, incentive to disperse because we will, we will just get to a completely alien temperature. And so um, that leads again to narrow elevation ranges and that uh, leads to um, uh, higher speciation rate. While everything is opposite in temperate zone where uh, seasonality is big, whether you are at low or high elevation. And so um, it's very likely that you will find at least some periods of the year um, uh, favorable at a different elevation than you are at the moment. And so, that leads to broad physiological tolerance, more, more dispersal, because you can find some suitable location at other climatic, climatic location at other elevation. And so that should suppress the, the speciation rate. Um, these are some data from, from Colorado as the temperate zone and equator as a Ecuador as the, as the tropical area. And um, yes, you can see that, um, it pretty much works as, uh, as suggested. And when, when we are looking at the limits, temperature limits, uh, minimum and maximum, where species are found, uh, this is for free insect groups with freshwater larvae, Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, Trichoptera, then indeed um, tropical location in orange has narrow, more narrow range between minimum and maximum temperature than the temperate zone, temperate zone fauna. When we look at the phylogenies of these insect species, then um, the temperate zone, uh, you can see visually without any formal analysis, there are uh, much wider ranges, elevational ranges than, than in Ecuador. And when we look at the speciation rate, which you can read from the length of the branches uh, at these phylogenies, then it's actually higher uh, in the tropics as predicted by, by Ben Jensen. Uh, the same patterns uh, was found in some other mountains. This is a bit different expression of it. Uh, this is how similar are communities at uh, different elevations. So that's basically a different expression of, uh, of mean elevation range. If the elevation range of species is narrow, then species at different elevations will be, will be more, more different and have lower faunal overlap. And uh, indeed, this is happening along latitudinal trend that in the tropics, you have 
very low overlap in species composition between uh, between locations of different elevation. They were actually measuring three different elevational contrasts uh, between 100 and 900, 5 and 1300, and 7 and 1500 meters. And they found that with these uh, steady contrasts, uh, the overlap uh, between communities was was growing uh, as you go from the tropics to the northern parts, uh, and that it was the case for all um, lizard snakes and frogs, but especially for frogs, they have the steepest curve. Okay, now when we look at the timberline and snow line, how it, um, uh, how it changes with latitude, then there is a fairly uh, perfect uh, linear increase uh, in uh, timberline uh, elevation as you go from, from uh, polar circle down to the temperate zone and towards the tropics. But then there is suddenly there is a plateau. So, so there is no difference in, uh, in the height of tree line uh, across the entire tropics from 20 degrees north to 20 degrees south. And then you go down again. Um, how these alpine zones look like, uh, there are some photos. Paramo, that's a local name for alpine grassland at Peru, uh, Mount Stanley in Africa, and uh, two, two landscapes in, in uh, Mount Wilhelm with uh, the moraine and the glacier lakes there because this was glaciated in the, in the last ice age and the, the tree ferns. So as we said, the altitude, the elevation, of the timberline is uh, starting very low in the beyond the polar circle um, at about 500 meter elevation. And then as we move towards tropic, then it's go higher and higher until we end up uh, at Mount Wilhelm at about 3,700 meters. Now, these are different locations and um, you can see different uh, dominant trees which are there at the timberline. And, you can go all the way from 65 degrees north uh, to subtropical range of 20 degrees, and you have always the same few um, genera of plants. You have Betula, Picea, Larix, and Abies, and um, they are always there. For the tropics, there is no dominant as such. There are some maybe more common species, and they will be different for each tropical mountain. Okay, this is the high art of zonation. It's very favorite pastime of, uh, of ecologists, try to somehow carve um, continuous gradient um, of elevation into some kind of distinct zones. We are not going to spend much time on that, except to look at these are different geographic regions with their alpine transition from the tropics, uh, from the tropical mountain forest to the alpine zone. Um, only uh, Hawaii, there is an island effect where um, there, is a, there is a lower transition. Um, when we go uh, in the neotropics forest, then there are these large grasslands, which we talked about. They are called two different terms, Paramo and Puna. The, the Puna and Paramo, it looks like it's a geographic terms that in the Northern Andes, they use Paramo and then, uh, then Puna for, for, the, for the Central and Southern. And these basically, there is no, no biological difference between the two terms, but uh, they can be either very lush, very, very humid um, green areas, or they can be semi-desert depending where they are located at high elevation. This is the rainfall map of, of that areas. And you can see that there can be even 100 millimeters or less a year, which is really desert conditions and going all the way to 2000 millimeters. So this is generally dry area, but again, you can have very different ecosystems there. Um, some plants at the limits of uh, timber uh, timberline are protecting their, their growing meristems by all kinds of insulation. It can be leaf rosettes, it can be hairs, it can be dry uh, dead leaves, as you can see here in the Senecio. Um, in Czech, it's Starczek, and then Lobelia in Africa. There are other 
um, grow forms which can be protected. You have some examples here. And uh, this is measurement showing that it indeed works. Uh, when you look at this uh, Senecio, then the leaf temperature goes way below into freezing, zero into freezing conditions, minus five, while the uh, leaf bud temperature is always above zero. There is an interesting um, convergence in evolution into this kind of um, protected plants in the alpine zones. And you know that they are coming from different families. So you have um, in the um, Mount Kilimanjaro era, you have uh, Dendrocenesio, Asteraceae, and, Lo and Lobelia, uh, Campanulaceae. Then there are Bromelias like that in, in the Neotropics, and then um, Asteraceae again. And then in Hawaii, there is also uh, Hawaiian Lobelia. So, so again, that, that's uh, recruiting from the same lineage as the African one. Now we mentioned grasses and um, there is a very clear and important transition between C4 and C3 gra grasses at about 2000 meters. You can see example in Kenya and also in Ecuador. Um, why is that? Well, um, C4, C4 plants um, are favored at a warm environment and also um, potentially with, with uh, lower atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide. That of course, until recently was sort of a constant. It was given, but now of course it's moving. And so we can predict that if there is a lot of global warming, then uh, sea free grasses will be increasingly favored. And so this transition will probably come at a lower elevation than today. Okay, why is this difference? What, what is C, C3 and C4? Um, basically, at the high temperatures and, and low, low CO2, um, the C3 uh, plants have a, a flaw um, uh, in the system uh, where their uh, enzyme Rubisco uh, starts failing to separate and distinguish uh, carbon dioxide and, and oxygen. And so this leads to so-called photorespiration. Um, uh, so basically the photosynthetic carbon is lost and uh, photosynthesis becomes inefficient um, while C4 solves this problem by concentrating CO2 internally and, uh, and then bringing it to the place of photosynthesis. But that's a costly, that's an uh, that's, that's, um, energetically costly way. And so this uh, additional um, bonus in faster photosynthesis. You can see the comparison between C3 and, and C4. The maximum rate is, um, is much higher, especially at high light intensity. So in this, en this energy rich environment, C4 grasses become more efficient. The C4 pathway um, has originated many times in the evolution of grasses. There is a phylogeny which shows um, between which shows uh, 20 origins to explain the patterns. The, the black are the lineages with, with uh, C4. And when we um, map the, the distribution on the mean annual temperature, then they will be mostly in the red area between 16 and 29 degrees. Generally with the altitudinal trends in the forests, it's not only C3, C4 grasses, but um, there are some other trends. Um, we can see, of course, the, the mean height is decreasing towards high elevation um, and stratification becoming simple. Buttresses are disappearing. Um, stilt roots are disappearing. Cauliflor is disappearing. Lianas are disappearing. On the other hand, um, uh, epiphytes, uh, lichens, mosses are increasing, and um, these are these are the main trends. The mountain forests look very different from the lowland. These are examples from New Guinea 2200. You will note large uh, uh, representation of epiphytes, especially mosses. And this is uh, extreme form. This is high altitude, so-called elfin forest. These elfin forests are have very high stem density and low low stature, often lots of epiphytes. 
This is an um, elfin forest from Tanzania, 2,400 meters. And this is the um, this is the biomass and water inception for for epiphytic uh, vegetation. So in the canopy, um, red is is um, biomass of um, uh, biomass of epiphytes and their intercepted litter and uh, on the right is uh, the weight of water incepted epiphytes on leaves and then on trunk um, so when you look at it then the the scale is the same for biomass in kilograms and water in liters and so this is really the main problem of the epiphytes at high elevations that they are representing a lot of physical stress by holding water, which is, of course, mostly mosses. Um, these elfin forests, they can have um, they can have up to eight times higher stem density than, for instance, lowland forests. But of course, the and even basal area will be will be higher. But then the leaf area index will be lower and uh, and the height will be also much, much lower. Now, when we talk about uh, elevational gradient being species diverse, that means that there is a lot of turnover of species. There is a lot of change with species composition with elevation, which is called beta diversity. Um, when we see that number of species is uh, decreasing uh, monotonically with elevation, like in this example, that can actually have two um, extreme uh, ways which generate this pattern. One here is green. That is basically that every elevation has a completely different set of species with very narrow distribution. And that set is getting smaller and smaller as uh, the elevation goes up. Another extreme is that lowland area has all the species. And then certain species are dropping out with increasing elevation. So both, both mechanisms will generate exactly the same uh, pattern. But of course, the beta diversity will be different. Here will be beta diversity will be basically complete. There is no overlap between between elevation gradients. And uh, in in uh, natural situations, of course, we have some kind of uh, intermediate situation or mix uh, between different species. So this is example of more more of that green me uh, mechanism where. None of these species of rhododendrons um, is spanning entire gradient at Mount Kinabalu. Rhododendrons are, of course, well-known mountain species. There are about 900 species of shrubs worldwide of rhododendrons, including 300 in Southeast Asia, including 50 uh, in Borneo, and 25 at Mount Kinabalu, five of them endemic to Mount Kinabalu. So here is the sequence of the species from the lowland uh, all the way to to about uh, four and a half thousand meters, the three and a half thousand meters. Now this is the distribution of all birds in terrestrial um, a part of New Guinea. So we are going from zero meters to four thousand five hundred. So each uh, uh, layer is one hundred elevation meters, and each column is one bird species. And so when we order them, you can see that the the blue system where we have lowland species which are slowly dropping to higher elevations is there and represents uh, more than half maybe even two thirds of species while then there is much less extreme um, system of uh, turnover between elevations um, as we have seen in green version of course here there is always some kind of overlap between different elevations now, some um, empirical patterns of um, uh, species diversity at Mount Wilhelm. You can basically see two very different um, responses to elevation. One is monotonous decrease in species diversity. For instance, birds from about 115 species per um, a lowland forest uh, going to less than 40 at, at the timberline. Um, it's even more extreme in butterflies or ants. Uh, ants even disappear completely before the end of the transect. Um, but then there are geometric moths and then also frogs and ferns, which actually like best the mid elevation. 
So we need to somehow explain these differences when we look. These were communities uh, at Mount Wilhelm, but we can also look at the fauna of New Guinea. And uh, that is known for birds, mammals, and butterflies. And again, you can see the, the general decline for birds and butterflies, and then mid elevation maximum for mammals. We can also look at how much these um, elevational gradients enrich um, the species diversity. You know, what would happen if there were no elevational gradients and there was only the most species rich community? So, for instance, for birds, the most species rich community has 300 species and the total species are 409, uh, 459. And so um, you can say that um, without the elevational gradient, the maximum uh, diversity there could, uh, could be would be uh, 300 species. And so 459 divided by 300 will give us that, um, that gradient is enriching um, the bird diversity by about 50%. It's actually quite similar for mammals and butterflies as well, for the New Guinea faunas. But when we actually look at the individual communities and broad range of taxa, uh, that enrichment is uh, more variable. Uh, the minimum one is in ficus, um, where uh, figs actually um, don't go all the way. They stop at 2,700 meters, and there is a huge peak in uh, at about 700 meters in, in diversity. And so there are 69 species uh, along the, this particular transect, and 15, uh, sorry, 49 of them are at single elevation. So that will already tell you that there is not much enrichment for that gradient. But on the other hand, uh, can be different for frogs where there are 76 species and only 22 are uh, occurring together at one location. So when we, when we do these ratios for different taxa, then indeed leaf hoppers and frogs are the highest and there the gradient is uh, increasing their diversity more than three times and the ficus is at the other end. Um, Rapoport's rule is actually something which goes a bit opposite to the Jensen predictions which we had. Um, Rappaport suggests that the high elevation species uh, will have wider elevational ranges um, than the low elevation species, simply because the land area is diminishing at high elevation. And so it makes sense for species living at the top of the mountains to be able to travel up and down uh, at different elevations, while, while the species in vast lowlands, they not only have no reason to do that, but they may not even be able to do that because there is nothing but, but lowland everywhere. So how does it work? When we look at these, again, these three New Guinea faunas, butterflies, birds, and mammals, when we look at the mean altitudinal range of all species which are found at given elevation, uh, which here are by 100 meters increment, then you can see you can see some kind of um, uh, Rapoport rule. Um, in the the mean altitude range is increasing from about 1,000 meters elevational for lowland species of, of birds and butterflies, and going to uh, almost double. For, uh, for birds, almost 2,000 at, at the highest elevation. Uh, likewise, when we look at plant communities at Mount Kenya, there the diversity is highest at uh, about 2,000 meters, considering that the whole gradient starts at 1,500 because the lower areas are, are disturbed. Um, so when they were looking at the same picture, the, the mean elevation range in the community, then they found quite substantial increases. So, so it, it, it works at least at Mount Kenya. Um, there are also more precise classification uh, in addition to what we had as a monotonous decrease and mid elevation range. Then in, in between, there are sort of intermediate cases of a plateau and then decrease or um, some smaller, slower increase to the mid elevation. Um, 
There is, can also be difference between the local and the regional. We have seen that already you can have local community or you can have regional fauna. And so what can cause these different patterns? Um, well, there can be causes for decreasing species richness of elevation, and that is typically unfav unfavorable abiotic environment. You know, weather is getting problematic, temperature goes down, um, and then diminishing habitat area with elevation. The mountains are peaks, and so they are sharp, and uh, the, the tops are smaller than the base, obviously. But then there needs also to be some, uh, case, some case for increasing species richness with elevation, simply because at least for those taxa which have mid elevation optimum. And that can be unfavorable biotic factors. That means high predation, parasitism, and competition at, at low elevations. And so the mid elevation peak can be either combination of these two factors going against each, each other. So, you know, it's too, dangerous in the in the lowlands and it's too cold uh, in the highlands so why not to be somewhere in the middle and then another another explanation are so-called geometric constraints which basically means that the mid elevation species can mix uh, elements from low elevation uh, genuine mid elevation and then high elevation species and that can create uh, um, a mid elevation peak there is an example of a study which uh, of the butterflies, um, which show such a mid range peak, not only for elevation of these butterflies, this is example from zero to 20, uh, 50 meters and um, with different species ranges. When you, when you look at the community diversity, then the mid elevation will be, will be highest, but the same phenomenon can be seen also from south to north. That's how the, um, how the rainforests are located. And so again, in the middle, where presumably species from south and north can mix is, is again, highest diversity. Now it's often underestimated how much um, change is there in the land area with elevation. Um, New Guinea is quite mountainous island, but when you split the land area by 100 meter elevation zones, you get this kind of extreme picture where um, more than half, well over half of all the area is within zero to 100 meters uh, zone. And all these zonations up to four and a half thousand meters is left, you know, for, for less than half of the land. This is the same graph on the logarithmic scale. So when you fit, um, we know that there is, uh, there is a classical ecological uh, rule that there is a, a positive increase in, in species uh, numbers with, with land area and, and there are quite well documented functional relationships for that. So if we fit this land area to the bird data um, and predict how they should be changing with elevation, when we ignore all the elevation related factors and only look at the land area. So we assume that everything else is the same. And, and then if we fit uh, the empirical data of birds to small land area, which means of course high elevations, then we get actually pretty good fit um, except for the lowlands. Yeah, when, when, we, when we follow the effect of area, then it, what it tells us that lowlands, although they have highest number of birds, if you remember, then uh, they should be even much more diverse because they are so huge. Um, this is another study uh, on palms in New Guinea. When you simply sample um, the elevation range, the, the elevation um, zones, then you get very nicely monotonously diminishing number of uh, palm species uh, with elevation. But then if you adjust for different elevation uh, areas, then you get a completely different mid-level mid peak because simply um, these relatively high numbers get diluted by even higher, even, even more disproportionate uh, land area numbers. And then, of course, at the high elevations, there are uh, almost zero land and almost uh, zero species. But when you look at the mid elevation, that is actually the, the uh, 
most favorable ratio of species to, to land area they have. Now, speaking about this um, predation and other uh, biotic activities, um, it's difficult to measure predation. You rarely see you know, act of predation. And while it's much easier to observe, for instance, uh, herbivory, and also herbivory leaves uh, holes in the leaves uh, behind it, uh, not the same is uh, true for most of the, most of the predation. Uh, so one way is to using a dummy uh, prey, either uh, plasticine caterpillars, like completely artificial, or uh, some live termites, for instance, some live baits glued to the leaf. Uh, this is based on the plasticine caterpillars. This is the attack rate. This is the, the rate of attack on, on a single caterpillar. And you can see that from elevation, um, uh, from the lowland elevation, where it's absolutely dominated by ants, uh, the ants are diminishing to the highlands, and so birds are sort of taking uh, taking over. Um, we took part in a global study by by our colleague uh, Thomas Roslin, um, where they were looking at latitudinal and elevational trends in these uh, attacks on plastics and caterpillars, and um, they saw that. There is a latitudinal gradient in predation intensity. The tropics is more dangerous than, than temperate zone, but that trend is driven entirely by insects, most likely ants, not by birds, which remain pretty much steady in terms of uh, predation intensity. So we can have this biotic favorability um, increasing because uh, big predation is, is going down and um, Abiotic favorability is uh, changing in opposite direction, and that could create the mid elevation maximum in abundance of herbivores and, and damage on, on phycal species, which were selected as a model group here. Um, the diminishing predation might be also uh, illustrated by the decreasing number of species of these predators with elevation. This is for bats, this is for ornitho, uh, this is for uh, insectivorous birds, and, and this is for ants. Uh, different elevations, even when we compare similar or, or, or same species, um, uh, can also have a very different food webs associated with them. This is example from Mount Wilhelm again for ficus trees. This is all ficus trees in the community at two extreme elevations for ficus, one at lowlands 200 meters and another at the limit of distribution at 2700. And you can see visually how different these webs are. You can see that uh, there is more herbivoral species attacking each single ficus species at high elevation than in the low elevation. That is so-called vulnerability, which indeed is higher. That's the orange bar. And then when we look at uh, specialization, then um, that's a bit confusingly called generality. That's, that's how federal species are. And um, again, you can see that um, you can see that here that um, there are actually uh, more specialized species at high elevation. That, probably they, they have fewer ficus species to choose from. And so typically each species is sticking with one host only. There are few ex uh, exceptions. While it's much more chaotic and flexible and you know, generally without discipline in the, in the lowland forest. Now we have an interesting question now, uh, what's happening with climate change? We know in the temperate zone, that uh, species are moving up the mountain slopes. Are they moving also in the tropics? That's very difficult to say because typically even for vertebrates, uh, there are very, very poor uh, historical records and, so, and it's almost impossible for insects because there, if you do a proper quantitative uh, insect community sample, then except for butterflies, pretty much everything will be dominated by morpho species. And you would have to preserve them with their, with their allocation of codes um, until the next study happens. That actually happened at Mount Kinabalu for the light wrapping of moths. Uh, you can see that the locations are without any change. It's, it's a national park after all. And the only reason this study could have been done between 1965 and 2007, so, so that means 42 years, uh, was that um, uh, Jeremy Holloway proved to be 
especially a resistance type of entomologist and was actually in the field in 1965 and then participated in the study in, in 07 again. And he actually kept his reference collection so the species could be cross-referenced to the same um, entities which uh, were recognized in 19, 1965. And so the conclusion was that if you uh, measure the average elevation for each species, then there was a 67 elevation meters uh, change in uh, mean elevation for geometric morph species between, between these uh, 42 years, which our colleague uh, Robert Ropek and his team, uh, long-term working at Mount Cameroon, did not find very um, agreeable uh, because uh, they they actually working on one of the most seasonal tropical forests where there is a dry season and then there is a huge rainy season where it rains um, 2,500 uh, you know 2,500 uh, milliliters uh, every every month, which is what you otherwise would have uh, over one year, and so they found that um, the seasonality change alone uh, can be uh, the mean species distribution being changed uh, from uh, minus 115 meters when you transition from one uh, season to another um, to in this case to to um, 60 66 meters so so there is a trajectory so, so there is a trajectory between these seasons, which can actually, if you came at different years, maybe even 40, 50 years separated and do single measurements, that seasonality variation can completely mislead you. So if you did it at Mount Cameroon, just in different seasons, then you could conclude the species are climbing astonishing 100 meters up or down, um, nothing could stop you. Um, Another interesting uh, feature of elevation gradients we don't have much time for uh, is altitudinal segregation due to competition. There is a classical study by Jared Diamond at the New Guinea Islands again. Uh, these are three closely related uh, parrot species. Therefore, there is a good chance they might be competing. There are some mountain ranges where um, each of these species, uh, the Placentalis and Rubrodonata, and as well as uh, rubricularis occupy the entire available elevation gradient. But then when at uh, two mountains, they happen to be coexisting, then uh, they always separate along the elevation. And finally, uh, mountains are also phylogenetically huge generator of species diversity. There are, this is um, phylogeny of um, uh, Fabaceae diversification, uh, mapped on the geography. And so you can see that um, there is um, one, when it comes to North America that starts from red, then the temperate zone is speciating much, much slower than once, once the uh, lineage got to, to the Andes. And, and so that explains this uh, latitudinal trends in diversity. At Mount Wilhelm, um, um, there was um, at Mount Wilhelm, there was, there was actually, um, it was possible to see the phylogeny in motion where we have molecular, molecular differences between lowland and highland populations of what was uh, considered to be one species of ficus and repeatedly in different ficus species. And also their specialized pollinating wasps, which were speciating, which were co-speciating with them. And here, this is again phylogeny of a uh, water beetle, uh, Exocelina genus, where um, you can map their current distribution in the highlands, about 1500 meters is orange, and then um, the lower elevation is yellow, and then the lowlands below 500 meters are green. And so you can see how long are the branches and what are the ancestors and how this whole um, speciation was, was going on. And the conclusion is that, again, another interesting title for the paper, the towering origin of New Guinea as a trigger for arthropod megadiversity. Okay, and um, interesting study 
uh, at Mount Kinabalu, where they sampled multiple uh, taxa and they were asking um, questions for endemics. There are about 25 endemic species, uh, sorry, 35 endemic species on Mount Wilhelm. And the interesting question is whether the closest relative is um, next to them in the lowland, because Mount Kinabalu is an um, isolated peak. And so all around are small hills or, or dipterocarp lowland forest. So, so did endemics speciate um, by splitting from the low elevation species, or was there a long distance uh, dispersal from other high altitude environments? And if so, are these current species still the same as the original population, or did they drift it and speciate it into a new species? So when they were looking at this study at uh, different uh, endemics, then they found all three mechanisms at, uh, you know, in motion. Uh, the, the by far largest number of species uh, had sister species in the lowland areas nearby. So it's actually lowlands who were providing uh, who were providing the the material for speciation. And then um, there were uh, sister species on tropical mountains in few species, and there was even uh, long distance dispersal where there were sister species at uh, in temperate zone in, in temperate zone areas. And uh, that is all we have uh, for elevational for elevational uh, gradient. So thank you for your attention.